morning to you. I did not know if I was going to be able to stand in the pulpit this morning. Uh, most of you know that I've been fighting some sort of virus this, most of this last week, but by God's grace and I believe by your prayers, many of you praying for me, and certainly myself praying really hard over the last several days uh, that I've been getting so much better. So thank you. And there's no place I'd rather be than be in the pulpit in front of you this morning proclaiming God's word. So glory to his name. I missed uh, last week because I was at a conference. So actually, I'm way back from a conference in Louisville, Kentucky. So um, I had the opportunity to meet with a lot of fellow pastors. It's always very encouraging and to... Uh, to have a a very edifying conference about uh, ministering in the local church. And so it was wonderful. So blessed to hear about uh, how Brother Jaime was able to preach in the bilingual service. It's always a wonderful time. And so we look forward to the next time we do that gathering together with our Spanish-speaking brothers and sisters. You all know that I travel a lot. I frequently get to strike up conversation with people who are from all over the place. In an airport terminal, in an air, you know, on an airplane is the best place because they're strapped in, they can't go anywhere. You get to talk to people. And especially if it's a non-believer, when the question comes up, you know, what do you do? And, oh, that's great, what do you do? I get the chance to tell them I'm, I'm a minister. And so that oftentimes opens up the door for me to share the gospel with them. But it's interesting as I think about our topic for today, we're in First Peter chapter 5, how great of a divergence there is of of expectations when I say I'm a pastor, what they assume that I do. I mean, it really varies so much uh, from, you know, from the age variation, from where they are in the country, to whether they have any background and connection to the church at all. There's a great deal of of confusion. But even within the church, I guess on one level, we expect that outside the church and and almost, you know, how, how could it be any other way? But even within the church today, there's a great deal of confusion regarding what a pastor is. Perhaps one minor reason is just the different theological perspectives that exist. And so uh, different denominations work out the church leadership a bit differently. So maybe, maybe that's a small part of it. We've seen different representations and we don't know which one is, is correct or if one is. Another reason might be simply because of poor models that we've seen. Maybe we've been at a church that seemed to have it right theologically, at least structurally, but then there was a very poor model of a pastor in a particular church. So maybe that affects us in some way. But likely, very likely, I think the foremost reason that there's so much confusion in what a pastor is, is the remaking of pastoral ministry in the last century or more, in which uh, Protestant churches in the United States especially uh, began to look outside of the church, the business world, for how they should model their church leadership rather than looking at the scriptures, rather than looking within the church. And that's where we are today. When I preached last, we finished chapter 4 in First Peter, and so we'll begin chapter 5 this morning. In chapter 4, those last several verses, we received a strong word about suffering in Christ, bringing together really his strongest discourse about suffering in a, really a book that is about suffering. First Peter. But then he ends with promises to God's faithfulness, this sweet promise, and then he shifts here. Really, when we begin reading chapter 5, you almost feel like it's a different book, but it's not. What he's really doing is he's beginning his final section, really beginning the conclusion of First Peter. And so we'll be moving there today. Peter speaks directly to the elders here. You see just those first few words there and Actually, in the original language, the first word is elders. He's addressing them, the leaders in the church. But that also means to us previously that he's been addressing the church more broadly, doesn't it? And that's actually the norm in the New Testament. Very rarely in the New Testament are letters written directly to the leaders or the elders in the church. Usually they're written to the church as a whole, to the Ephesians, to the Corinthians, to the church that is in such and such. And the reason for that is, and the reason uh, that we as Baptists have have practiced congregational polity is that the church as a whole is responsible and accountable before God. And so these letters, these New Testament epistles are ultimately written to the church as a whole. But he speaks directly to the elders here for just a few verses. And I think it's going to make for a very powerful understanding of what an elder is, what an elder does, and how the sheep and the shepherds ministry should respond. 
Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Peter gives this word to the elders in these churches in, in Asia Minor, scattered across what is uh, really northern Turkey today, where he's writing this letter. He exhorts the elders to shepherd God's flock and urges humility from the sheep. Would you read the text with me, beginning in verse 1? So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you. Not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. The scriptures declare to us that elders should shepherd the flock in love and in sincerity. And the sheep should follow in humility. And if the scriptures are the word of God, that means that they are as if God himself stood before us and spoke to us. They come with the same bearing, the same authority. And so if that's the truth, then then how should we respond? This is how I believe we should respond to this text. To the elders, that includes the man speaking in front of you, and to anyone who would aspire to be an elder, let's live up to this calling, knowing that the chief shepherd is coming. And then to all the church, Let's live together in humility and submission to God's order. Would you pray with me? Thank you, God, for your holy word. Thank you, God, for the saints that are gathered here with us, God. I ask that you would open their hearts, God, that they would understand, that they would receive, that we would live this out in obedience. And, oh, God, if there are any here who do not know you, I pray you would open their hearts to believe, God. Save them. Bring the dead to life today, God, and your miraculous work that you, Holy Spirit, alone can do. God, I pray that your church would be built up, encouraged, convicted. I pray, God, that you would be glorified as a result of this message. And amen. So four points arise from this text. The first three, again, address shepherds. And the fourth addresses the whole flock, that is the whole church. So the first then, what shepherds do. Would you look back to verse 1? So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. So again, he's speaking here to the elders. But I don't want to assume that we even know for certainty who the elders are. What does he mean by elder? We use that word around here, but still. Are elders simply members who are more advanced in years? Is that what he's talking about? Some of us might think that if we're not careful. I've said elder and shepherd and pastor, and we know that the Bible uses other words like bishop and overseer. What do all these terms mean? Is it possible that I'm distinguishing between these? Well, no, I'm I'm not actually. They refer to the same office. So three different ways, really, in this text that he's referring to this same office in the New Testament. In our circles, pastor's probably the most common. It really speaks more about the role of the office, shepherding being very closely related to that. But really, elder is actually the more common biblical term that's used much more, probably three or four times as many uh, occurrences in the New Testament. But it's referring to the same office. An elder is a pastor and a pastor is an elder. And they oversee and they shepherd. So I said it up front just so that there's not any confusion here. In a moment I'll explain the metaphor of shepherding a bit more. Again, never wanting to assume that because we've heard these things several times that we really know what the scriptures are talking about. It's good for us to rethink these things for those of us who's heard them many times and for those of us who maybe have not heard them to understand them rightly from the beginning. Peter calls himself a fellow elder. Isn't that interesting? In some sense, what he's saying here is, hey, I'm I'm one of you. 
You guys that are leading the churches, these churches that are under great pressure and they're struggling, hey, I'm, I'm one of you. I'm there with you. You're not alone. But, but Peter's not serving one of these churches, is he? So he's not a local church pastor. He's not a, a local church elder. So why is he saying that? How can he be a fellow elder? Well, Peter's one of the 12 apostles. And so I note here just on the side that the apostles held a, a special office that went out as they all died. It no longer exists. We have two offices in the, in the New Testament church today. We have the office of deacon and the office of elder. And you all basically have some understanding of those. And we'll have a better understanding, I believe, by the end. But Peter, as an apostle, has a special calling to shepherd, really, churches, so to speak. We see that with the Apostle Paul as well, the way he speaks to the churches as one who is showing leadership over them, although he's not necessarily serving these particular churches. So just to explain that briefly. But more generally here, Peter seems to be emphasizing really his affinity with them. He could emphasize his apostleship. He notes it clearly in chapter 1, verse 1. So there's no confusion there that he's denying his place as an apostle. But he's emphasizing his own unity with them in their suffering in their struggles. And he spells out in the rest of this verse, look back there with me. He is a witness of their sufferings of Christ, of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Such beautiful language, isn't it? Awaiting what is really coming in verse four. And so I'll wait until we get to verse four to really discuss that in more detail. He will be a partaker in the coming glory. But on the side, I'll note that this verse also seems to imply a plurality of elders. That word there, use elders, is always in the plural in the New Testament. Did you know that? It never occurs in the singular of any place that I've been able to find, which is important for us. Because more to the point, that this word elder implies plurality, more than one. Having said that, there's a very long tradition in the church that there would be a single elder or single pastor But it seems that in the New Testament, it's pretty clear that there would have been more than one in each of the churches. We know that was true in Jerusalem. We see in the book of Acts that being the case that the apostles are uh, putting in elders in every church, every town that is. So this is important for us to note just on the side. Many of the churches in our age have actually rediscovered this. They look at the New Testament and they see this here and they say, well, why wouldn't we follow the model that the apostles are setting up? Is there not wisdom in that? Is there not God-ordained authority in that? And so many churches would do that. In fact, we've done that at Emmaus, haven't we? And so I'm not the only pastor. I do the, the primary teaching, and there's a unique role even illustrated with Timothy as he's sort of a pastor, uh, sort of lead elder, so to speak, a lead pastor. And so there's some wisdom in that. But I'm not the only pastor here. There's four of us. And so the, the wisdom in that is is. Great, and we could spend a lot of time talking about that. But just to say there's biblical precedent in that. We're certainly not getting this from the business world where the CEO is glorified. Look at verse 2 with me. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly. Peter exhorts the elders to shepherd the flock. Now again, as I said even a moment ago, For those of us who have heard this for much of our lives, if you grew up in the church, this language of shepherding, shepherds, the sheep, it doesn't sound strange to us. But again, we can lose some of the nuance and the the depth of the meaning there. But if someone is not familiar with this, if you're visiting with us, if you're not a member here, this would rightfully sound kind of strange. Shepherding was a common vocation in the ancient Near East and in many places today, it's a common vocation. My own wife's family had sheep at one time, her grandfather being a shepherd in Missouri. It wasn't a glorious job, but it needed to be done. They needed, that, they needed the wool to make the fabrics for society, so it was an important job, but it wasn't glorious. And yet, God chooses it, the Holy Spirit chooses it to depict life in the local church so well. And between Christ and and the church universal. So there's really two ways we look at this. Christ is the chief shepherd, as we'll see in verse 4, over the church as a whole, and yet pastors in the local church shepherd in a local, in a small, a limited way. 
Now, it's an analogy. It breaks down at some point. It's not saying in every way that a shepherd acts with his sheep, thus we as pastors act with, the, with our flock, so to speak. But it is a beautiful picture here. Maybe let's think about some of the details together. The shepherd knows his sheep. He spends time with them. He's among them. He's not a distant or, or sort of outside observer. He's among them. He protects the sheep. He directs the sheep. And the sheep follow the shepherd because they know him and they trust him. He's not an impartial observer. He personally knows them. In a nutshell, this is a a picture of the shepherd and the sheep. And we could spend so much more time. We could look at Old Testament imagery, of course, with David being a shepherd and so on. And we could look at John chapter 10 with Jesus. And in fact, later we will very briefly. But in case of any confusion, Peter reminds them that the flock, that the church is ultimately God's. See the accountability there? This implies great stewardship, great responsibility. I remember one time a professor that I was working for at the seminary uh, was going to be out of town. I believe he was going to be speaking at a conference. And I had not been working for him that long, maybe just a couple of months. (coughs) Excuse me. And he asked me if I'd be able to stand in for him and lecture in his class. And I said, absolutely. And as soon as I said that, I thought, boy, this is, this is pretty heavy. This is quite a responsibility. It's a class of about 100 students probably, a systematic theology class, graduate students. This is a very well-respected professor, a very well-known, very beloved, rightfully so. And so it began to weigh in on me. I was going to have to stand in front of these students for about three hours. And really, there's a great stewardship in that. And so I spent a great deal of time studying that, knowing the responsibility, knowing the stewardship. This is not ultimately my class. There's a certain stewardship when it's my own class, and that is a great stewardship. But how much more when it's someone else's? And so I'm being very careful about every word I'm crafting in my lecture. I'm being very careful how I answer questions. I'm being especially careful how I show honor to him because it's his class, so if his name comes up and so on and so forth. And it was a wonderful experience, but I took it very seriously. We, the elders of Emmaus, intend to shepherd this flock with that sort of weight, with that sort of responsibility and stewardship because the scriptures demand it. Would you pray for us? Please, pray for us during the week. We pray for you. That's part of our calling, to pray for you as the sheep, that God would bless you, that you would know him more, that you would pursue him in holiness, that you would not be sifted out by the adversary? Would you pray for us that we'd be faithful to our calling? Please, pray for us. Encourage each of the elders as they fulfill their calling. Each of us kind of have different emphases that we, that we oversee with, with Drew, uh, now especially going to be having a hand over the MCs and Uh, the way that that Sam oversees our prayer ministry, oftentimes overseeing the Lord's Supper and so on, and even his involvement with the MC, and Alex overseeing music ministry and and leading and teaching through that capacity. And of course, all of them teaching and and preaching in other capacities, and me doing the the bulk of the preaching and, and vision casting. Pray for us. Maybe you would, because there's four of us, maybe every week of the month, pray for a different elder. I would be so honored to know that I have brothers and sisters praying for me. I need it. I truly do. Pray that God raises up more as the church grows by, uh, by God's grace, I pray, that we would have even more men come up and shepherd and lead this church. Peter exhorts the elders to exercise oversight. Uh, if, if the previous idea of shepherding is emphasizing the the caring and the protecting of the flock. The oversight here in the verse is speaking more of the managing, more of the the leading in the passage. Elders are leaders, make no mistake. It's very clear in the scriptures. I emphasize that to say that many churches today miss this. Many churches today miss this badly. Badly. Somehow many churches, even in our own city, I can think of several that I've connected with and several that I've had even intimate connection with where there's a deacon board that really is the, the leaders in the church, that they are the ones who pull the strings, they're the ones who have the say. It's a board of deacons who are laymen, 
They're not elders. They're not shepherds. They're not teachers. And they're the ones who rule. How, how can you get that looking at this? It's not here. There's no mention of elders whatsoever here. Or excuse me, deacons. We have a whole lot of, of scriptures that does speak about deacons. First Timothy chapter 3 and 4 and in Titus and in elsewhere. We see it worked out in the book of Acts, of course. Elders are, excuse me, deacons are servants, they're doers, and that's very important. There's a great dignity to that office. The church needs godly deacons, but they're not overseers. They're not elders. They're not shepherds. So it's important for us as men and women who are following after the scriptures for us to understand these distinctions between these two offices. As I mentioned at the beginning, sadly, in the 20th century, many churches were inspired by the business world. Again, the industrial revolution of the 19th century and and all the business world that was coming in the early 20th century and the rise of that sort of culture coming into the churches, uh, they made a board of deacons, much like a board of trustees in an organization. And yeah, they have to have a head that's doing some things, but the board of trustees is, is really the power behind the throne, so to speak. And so churches simply took that in. And oftentimes the laymen who were serving as deacons were businessmen. And so, of course, you could go to uh, a, a very popular church in New York City and John D. Rockefeller is leading the board of deacons in a Baptist church. And he's funding that Baptist church as well. And so I say those things to say that we should not automatically look at the organization of church and ask, oh, does it work? Okay, good, it seems to be working, let's use that. But the scriptures lay these things out for us for a reason. In God's wisdom, he knows It's no wonder that we look at our churches oftentimes and see that they are so unhealthy. No wonder if we have not followed God's word. The church is not a business. It's not an agency. It's not a corporation. It's God's flock. The church is a spiritual entity. It is the bride of Christ. And it takes spiritual oversight to lead the church, not business acumen. If a pastor has an MBA... That's, a, that's fine. That's a wonderful thing. But if he can't rightly divide the word of truth on a Sunday morning, he's no pastor. The scriptures are clear. Elders or pastors, again, those things interchangeably, they shepherd the flock and exercise oversight for the church. But remember the church ultimately belongs to God. And thus the scriptures tell us that. So Peter tells us here what shepherds do. They care for, protect, lead, oversee. In large part, they do this through teaching. We see that elsewhere in the scriptures. But in this text now, number two, what shepherds do not. Would you look at verse two with me? Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly tells us here that elders should not minister under compulsion. In other words, elders should have a wholehearted, full-orbed desire to serve. There should be no hesitancy, no reluctance in their mind. The calling is too high and the work is too hard for someone to enter, someone to enter ministry under some sort of compulsion. In our seminary class this week with the guys, eight of the men here at the church taking the class, uh, we were reading a book and discussing a book this week about how to find elders and deacons for the church and how to discern who, who would fit into this rubric. And one of the first things that we have to ask is, do they have a desire to lead? If they don't, well, that's a good determiner that they, they don't they belong there. They might have gifts and and opportunities that would function very well in other places in the church. But if there's no desire to lead, to shepherd, well, then they don't belong doing it. They need it. The scriptures tell us so. Common sense would tell us so even. Remember the background of persecution here. If a shepherd, if an elder, if a pastor is lukewarm, how do you think he's going to do when the real pressure comes on? He's going to stand his ground He's just a hireling. He's going to jump ship. And oftentimes, this is an area of special interest to me because of my historical research. 
uh, we see that as military campaigns came through, for instance, in the American Revolution along the East Coast, when the British would come in, uh, there were certain pastors that would boom. As soon as any sign of intrusion were coming in, they ran to the hills. I mean, literally, actually, they ran westward. There are some pastors that stuck it out and said, uh-uh, I'm staying. I'm staying with my flock. I'm staying with my people. They have to have that desire. The lukewarm and the mediocre and those that are serving under compulsion will not be able to stand in the hard times. I'm afraid to ask the question, and I have to ask myself this because of my work that I'm doing with a lot of my research, how pastors in America today would do under such pressure. Would they buckle? Would they flee? Or would they stand firmly and say, I'm going to shepherd my church even through these hard times, even through a great depression? I'm going to stand and, and pastor my church or even through an, uh, some, some other sort of hardship in the community, even through a plague even through social chaos and social pressure, I'm going to stand and shepherd my church. We need to pray that our pastors would stay faithful. The text says, not under compulsion, but willingly. Pastors should minister with a willing heart. They should serve freely in their task with, with joy. Joy is implicit here. I meet with pastors regularly. Again, this week, being at a pastor's conference, I met many men for the first time and always asked, where are you serving? And, oh, that's fantastic. How long have you been there? And, and I don't ever ask this question. I don't ever ask, do you have joy in your pastorate? <laughs> but you can tell. And it, it really warms my heart when you meet that guy that you can tell he's just on fire and just loves what he's doing. He just wants to tell you all the exciting things going on. He's not, you know, sort of forgetting that there are hardships. And it's not that he's sort of in la-la land, but you can just tell he's just genuine. He loves serving his church. And then other times when you meet men that you can tell are just beleaguered and wish that they could get out and are only there because they feel like they have no other way to make ends meet for their family. It's always very sad. You feel sad for the, for the brother, but you also feel sad for the church. And this is again not to imply that the one who serves willingly and joyfully will never face hardship. We all do. He will. It's not that he'll never get tired. He will. But there's a consistent joy with the task. Elders should not minister for shameful gain, but eagerly, the Holy Spirit tells us. This is a warning against greedy motives. It could be greed for power, it could be greed for attention, but specifically here it seems even more so to be greed for financial gain, for money. But you might ask, say, so could they be greedy for money in these early churches? If any of you know anything about the background, you know these are not big, wealthy, established churches. These are mostly lower class and relatively small churches. This is the church in its infancy here. So the, the church is not this great power that it later becomes. But, you know, it, it doesn't take vast amounts of money to be greedy. Greed is a matter of the heart. It can affect people on very small levels. You can be greedy for your friend's $5 when you're a kid. And you see that and you just think, man, I want that 5 bucks. It's 5 bucks. Can't even buy you a hamburger anymore. Greed can be, uh, it can affect us on many different levels. Greed is an issue of the heart. I've seen it ruin ministers. I've seen it ruin ministries. Pastors must be on guard about this temptation, and I'm constantly reminding myself that. Churches must be mindful as they seek elders. Is this man one who would be tempted toward greed easily? Is, it one, uh, is he one who would be susceptible towards greed? They need to be asking that. We need to be asking that. Just as a side note, some of you might be tempted to sort of tune some of this out because I'm talking an awful lot about elders and two elders. Peter is specifically talking to elders, and that's true. But it is the church that is ultimately responsible for, before God. Remember? We established that earlier. So it's not just the elders. So it is the church who chooses the elders. So it's not like the church goes, oh yeah, that elder's messed up, but that's not on us. You chose the man. So there is a responsibility for the church as a whole. There's a responsibility for the church as a whole, not only in, in bringing him on, but sustaining him also. 
Let me tell you, if, if the day comes that I start preaching heresy, do me a favor and fire me. Fire me. It's better that I go work at O'Reilly and live in my parents' basement and ride my bike to work than destroy God's flock. So there is always an accountability in the church. There's a special office here and a special honor and a high calling given to the elders. And I think we understand that as a church. But there's also an accountability in the church. And that's implicit here in this text. So pray for your elders. Encourage your elders. But also watch them. Because none of us are above it. We're all men. We're all fallen. And only by God's grace can we be faithful. So we need your prayers. We need your encouragement. We need your accountability. These are the terms to which we hold our leaders. Verses 5 through 4. Verse 3, look there with me. Not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Oh, he says elders should not domineer. They should not be greedy. They should not work under compulsion and they should not domineer. A man should not serve as an elder out of a desire to rule over people. The minister should serve freely without any tint of greed. Yes, but also the desire to rule over people, the desire to domineer is an ungodly desire and it will hurt the flock. Hands down, one of the most common things that we see. I can think of a church, one that I know very well, one that I know intimately here even in the Bay Area where I witnessed. It was from a distance. I wasn't there at the church at the time, but many friends that were still there, family that were there. And it grieved me so much to see a pastor who domineered the church and ultimately ruined it. I mean, just tore it to shreds. They fired him, he's gone, but the church remained just in shambles. Even more regretfully, the church hired another man who did the same thing. And I mean, today the church is essentially dead and this was once a, at least outwardly, a very thriving church, especially for Bay Area standards. A domineering, power-hungry, prideful man can destroy a church just as easily as heresy can. Instead, the text tells us the elders should be an example to the flock. This is our calling at Emmaus. For the four of us that serve as elders here, this is our calling. We should be godly examples in our, in our conduct, in our devotion before the Lord, and in our leadership. And to Emmaus as a whole, this is our standard. Again, this is, what, this is what you need to hold us to. We're not perfect men. Our calling is high and we must strive to be faithful to it. Please pray for us. When the time comes for us to bring on new elders, and we're actually looking at that process right now, we must not forget this. We must not accept anything less. So Peter knows that pastors can abuse the office given them. No one's perfect, including pastors. The temptations to minister under compulsion or greed by domineering are real. But a warning stands to those who would abuse God's sheep. But at the same time, as we look at verse 4, reward awaits those who shepherd faithfully. Number three, what shepherds await? And let's look at verse 4 together. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. What a beautiful idea. There is the chief shepherd. This implies an important accountability. We have a perfect role model to follow. We can't say, for for the person who was a a new pastor, he can't say, I I never had a, a role model. A good role model is a pastor. You have the chief shepherd as a role model. We have the perfect role model. This also implies hope and vindication. The warning is implicit. Really, the key thing here is for the faithful pastor who is continuing on and is persevering, there's an, there's an implied hope and vindication here. We might think of those who've struggled in pastoral ministry, although being faithful, 
They've been, they've been knocked down and attacked, and they've been faithful, and this crown awaits them. I think of, I know I've, sh- I've surely shared something of this illustration with you before, but it's just seared in my, my memory. Very early in my ministry, really my first legitimate staff position at a church, real meaningful paid staff position at a church. It was in Port Allen, Louisiana. And uh, I was, there was, it, it was a big transition for us. Joy was pregnant, so we were starting a family. I was starting seminary, my first substantial church ministry position. It was just an exciting time for us. So much hope, so much ambition. And I think that's why it's so seared in my mind. And we saw this church tear this pastor to bits. I was just a staff pastor. I was working with the youth. And yet this poor man, and he seemed to be a faithful, godly man. Not perfect, but a faithful and godly man. And we saw the church tear him to bits, tear his family to bits. And the man ultimately left the ministry for several years. And to that man, this text would say, be faithful. Stand in there. The chief shepherd is coming. Hope is coming. Vindication is coming. The crown is coming. The Holy Spirit tells us the chief shepherd will reward his under shepherds with the unfading crown of glory. So to the shepherds, I would say, stay faithful, brothers. I preach this to myself. I've been preaching this to myself all week working on this. Of course, I've never been tempted in this way. But some lesser men might be challenged to be tempted in this way. No, honestly, of course, the truth is we all face obstacles. And there's no perfect church. There's no perfect scenario. We all face challenges. We all face adversaries, burdens to bear, weariness, fears. But this passage reminds us, it reminds me to be faithful to the calling for great is the reward. In church, I would ask you again to pray for us. Pray for me. Encourage these brothers who serve here so faithfully. The best way to find encouragement is in the scriptures here in verse 4. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will, have, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Now, all Christians receive a crown of glory, don't they? There's a sense in, in which all Christians receive reward. Of course they do. All Christians receive the bliss of heaven. But there seems to be a special reward implied here for pastors. We see special levels of awards elsewhere in the New Testament. Heaven is, is not a, a commune. It's not run by communists. Not all will be equal. All will be wonderful. But not all will be equal. How else would the scriptures tell us to store up treasures in heaven? Seek reward. We're all told to do that. We're told not to seek earthly rewards. Earthly acclaim. But in heaven, it's fair game. Christ himself says this to us. What a wonderful thought that we can store up rewards where moth and rust do not destroy. We've seen what shepherds do. We've seen what shepherds should not do as Peter exhorts the elders. We've witnessed the great rewards that await those who remain faithful to this high calling. But briefly now, Peter turns from the elders in particular to look at the church. What the sheep do. Look at verse 5 with me. Final verse of the passage. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. But now wait a sec, you might be saying. I thought you said that this passage was not a simple sort of younger and older relationship here. It's not. Don't be confused. The previous four verses make that very clear. This isn't talking about elder in the sense of older people and younger in the sense of, of kids in the church and so on. Uh, that, that The relationship in the first several verses wouldn't make any sense. It's not as if everyone over 40 is a, an elder in the church and thus teaching and leading and oversight in this way. That wouldn't make any sense. We know from the rest of the Old Testament that's not so. It's clearly speaking about the New Testament office. But what's possibly going on here as we look at verse 5, is a rebellious culture in the youth, perhaps? In Asia Minor, it's not certain that that's it. What it could be is referring uh, sort of figuratively to new believers as young in the faith. And so there's a, a sense of those who are coming into the church, and so perhaps they're young and prideful, and they're resistant 
to submitting to the leadership of the elders in the church. Could be either one of those. We can't be totally sure. But what is clear in Peter's mind here is that the elders are the overseers and thus the church submits to them. The sheep, that is the members of the church, should submit to the elders as leaders. And you know, in in our, just being very transparent, in our anti-authoritarian age, we don't like authority. This might be hard for some of us. We don't like submitting to anything or anyone. We feel like John Wayne, you know, we're like on our own. We just do our own thing. I don't need to submit to anybody. And if that's you, I pray the Holy Spirit would change your heart. Not just so that you'll submit, but so that you'll see the beauty of it. In following God's design, the beauty that is there. There's always innate beauty in obeying the Lord. Always. Without any exception. When the pastor shepherd is, leads as described here, and as the people follow this, glorifies God. It builds up the church. And what's the key in this text for this design to work? One word, humility. Look there again with me. With humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. He quotes from Proverbs here. Humility is key for the church to function rightly. Tom Schreiner, a commentator, says, humility is the oil that allows relationships in the church to run smoothly and lovingly. Got to have the oil in there. Or else things burn up and blow up. I remember this one time I was at work at the auto parts warehouse when I was in college and a friend came in with a long look on his face and I said, you know, what's going on? And he said, I was, I was changing the oil in my truck and my girlfriend didn't know and she got in my truck to go pick up some pizza and uh, my engine's trash. She drove about 10 miles. She said she noticed it started smoking and making some weird noises, but without oil in that engine, it burned up pretty quick. He said, I got to tear it apart and totally replace it. Luckily, the guy knew what he was doing. He was able to do that. You have to have the oil in there to keep from friction. It's just basic common mechanical sense. I don't know if they broke up after that. I I probably would have broke up with her after that. Not if I was married, though. I mean, if you're married, that's it. But it was his girlfriend. Better get all that stuff out before marriage. I'm kidding. This verse really is leading into our our next message very well, but we must have humility among one another. Even as we've thought about so much in 1 Peter, the way we need to know one another and give grace to one another in our relationships so that we can fellowship and do the work of the church together. If we're always questioning one another and backbiting and and always waiting for any excuse to be offended, well, we're always going to be offended and things are never going to function right. So we need to have grace. We need to be willing to always expect the best from someone. When we get a a text or a phone call that just sort of seems short and we're like, is is he being mean to me? Always assume that he's not. Always assume that he's probably running into the DMV and texting you on his way in. Always assume the best for your brothers and sisters in Christ. They deserve that. They're people for whom Christ shed his blood. And we need humility among one another to live together. So although the bulk of this text is directed at pastors, the application affects all of us, as I've said. The pastor must heed this exhortation, but the church also holds him to it. So to our elders here, to anyone who would aspire to be an elder, let's live up to this calling, brothers. Knowing that the chief shepherd is coming. And to the church, let's live together in humility and in submission to God's order. But where is the gospel in this text? Well, you shouldn't have to dig very far. The gospel is right in the center of this text. Christ is our chief shepherd, and the chief shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Think so beautifully of John chapter 10 and the language there. Because Christ laid down his life, we can have eternal life. If we repent of our sins, if we believe in him, (coughs) excuse me, if we trust only in him for our salvation and follow him in obedience, we can be saved. 
I rejoice for every one of you that is walking in obedience in Christ. I truly do. I pray for you. If you are a member here, your name is on a list that I carry on my iPad and I carry a hard copy in my bag. I pray for you and I rejoice if you are following after Christ in obedience. Praise the Lord. But if that's not you, this is a picture of the flock. Come join us. If you're not following after him, if you've not put your faith in him, if the Holy Spirit has not opened your heart to believe, you can today. Come, join the flock. Our chief shepherd is kind. His burden is light. He is merciful. His arms are open. He will not cast you away. But the time is running short. The time is not infinite. There comes a time when the door on the ark will be closed and the wrath of the flood will come. And all will be destroyed. And only those inside will be saved. The chief shepherd will return. And he will take his sheep to be with him. But he will cast out all the goats. All of them. Think of Matthew 25. It's time to pray. But before I pray, I want to encourage you this morning. And I want to encourage you with perpetuity in this to allow yourself to to remain in a spirit of worship as we go into our time of song, as we give our offering, as we have our time of benediction, and how you will respond to this message. If you're a believer, that you'd respond and be willing to pray, being willing to hold up this standard, being willing to, to exercise humility in the church. But perhaps if you're an unbeliever, that you would allow the Holy Spirit to draw you, that you might be willing even today, to bow your knee to Jesus Christ. All knees will bow. Everyone will bow at some point. But if you bow in this time, if you come to him in this time, before the door of the ark is closed, an image that's been in my mind this week, oh, he welcomes you with open arms. So I pray that you might remain in that spirit of worship in response as we lead.